Hi again. Um, so in this uh, session, I'm going to talk to you about a different topic, uh, identity and access management, but again to do with APIs. Um, so uh, I will, in this talk, I will touch very briefly um, on some of the topics that uh, Cristoni um, touched in his talk as well. However, uh, I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on the authentication aspect and how it uh, plays a role uh, with the APIs. Uh, and then some of the features that we've added to Identity Server um, uh, lately, and then how uh, some of them, that can be uh, interesting to you. Um, so with, uh, with also my previous talk, I'm going to start off with an example. Um, so assume that you are um, planning your vacation, and you're using uh, this site called bestvacation.com to um, plan and uh, buy uh, the whole vac or get, get the whole vacation arranged as a package. Um, so you're looking at a couple of destinations, uh, Peru, Bali, and of course Sri Lanka. So eventually what you do is you, you settle for Sri Lanka um, because it's rated as the top destination to go to. So you plan your vacation um, using this site um, uh, and then uh, allow that site to choose certain things for you, such as flights, hotel bookings, car rentals, um, and all of that for you as a package. Um, and what it also does is, uh, with, a, with adding a nice touch, it also gives you a tourist sim, um, which you can use when you go to the destination and then you, know, you can um, use the internet freely uh, using the mobile networks there. Now, uh, for you to get all of this organized as a package, you would have given certain information to this site. Obviously, your travel dates, uh, your preferences of, for airlines, your budget, um, so on and so forth. Maybe a rating of the hotels and so on that you want to, you want it to be, uh, you want it to consider. So, um, what happens behind the scenes is obviously um, such a site um, doesn't do everything on its own. It goes and connects to multiple systems that are out there um, that are also providing different services such as flight bookings, hotels, and so on and so forth. Um, each of those uh, systems in turn might be using some of those data that you submitted to this site um, to again uh, make some guesses, make some uh, choices for you between uh, airlines, hotels, uh, and even mobile operators, right? To get, get you the best deal for your budget. Uh, so let's keep on going further and further into this. So if you, if you concentrate on just one of these uh, interactions between bestvacation.com and uh, one of these providers. Um, so there's some sort of integration happening between these, uh, obviously, um, and then there's some sort of um, information exchange happening, um, and we can further explore this as to how these things happen. So if you zoom in further, uh, you may be um, browsing this on a, on a mobile device or you're using a, a, a web browser to um, uh, go on and then uh, use their website, um, there's a very high chance that they are using APIs behind the scenes. That API may use one or more services behind the scenes as well. Uh, in this example, I've just mentioned microservices. It doesn't have to be microservices only, but um, you have something that is obviously in the back end. Um, and then in turn, these microservices might be talking to other uh, software as a service providers out there on the internet that again, um, expose their capabilities as APIs. So there's a lot of interactions happening between these systems uh, and the devices that you're using. So these are obviously happening through APIs as we've learned from uh, morning up till now. Um, so um, one key thing to remember here, are these are actually the points of information exchange, right? So if you're thinking about security, these are the points that you have to be careful about because these are the points where information can get leaked or if it goes into the uh, wrong hands that they are not supposed to, um, there might be huge um, you know, security breaches and so on. So what do you do? You have to have some way of securing these integration points and that's where API security comes into play. All, most of you here, I'm sure, know all of this, right? So let's look at how um, and what techniques we can use for this. Um, so if you think about, again, take a, take a step back, think about how an API is used. The API usually is used by a client, which is a, some sort of an application, website, mobile device, whatever. Um, it has, uh, so there is a, uh, so it has, give, it has been given access to use that API. Um, 
and then based on the user who uses the application, what the application can do using that API can be limited. <coughs> Are you all in agreement with that, right? So that can be managed by various techniques, um, but if you, if you find some of these, that these three terms that are here on this slide familiar, then that means you know some of these techniques, right? Um, so first thing is uh, ID token. Uh, it comes from uh, the open ID space. The ID token um, is something that identifies who the users are, the identity of the user. So it's primarily used for authentication. Uh, or as a result of the authentication, you get that ID token. Then there's also this thing called an access token that um, Tristan also mentioned about, um, which is um, a way of providing uh, access to use some resource out there uh, for a brief period of time, um, and then maybe uh, with some limited capabilities. So one example I can give you for these two is assume that you, uh, so let's, let's say you have a, your employee ID that's issued from your company. That is very similar to your ID token because it identifies who you are. It has maybe has a, has a photo of you, or your name, and maybe a few other details. If you're staying at a hotel uh, attending this event, you might have got a key card from the hotel, right? That is pretty much an access token because the hotel decides what you can do with that access to uh, that card. You can probably only open your room the door of your room and maybe go to the gym and maybe a few other common spaces only. So the hotel decides that um, what type of access you should get with this um, key card. So that's uh, pretty much uh, very similar to an access token in the API world. Then you have a refresh token. Um, so the access tokens, as I, as I mentioned, uh, is a way of granting access to um, APIs and some protected resources. Uh, very temporarily, right? So there is a time limit that's tagged onto or attached to that access token. After that time, the, the token expires and you can't obviously use it. So you have to have some way of obtaining another access token. And that is where the refresh token comes into play. So in um, to just preventing, um, so it is there to prevent you from submitting your credentials over and over again. Instead, you use your uh, refresh token and then use that to ask for a new access token. So this is how the API um, security works usually at a very high level. Um, and then you might also have heard of this term called OAuth2, which is the authorization framework behind um, <coughs> these access tokens. So OAuth2 by design only handles the authorization part of it. There's it doesn't handle the authentication part of it, right? So it's all about granting some sort of access to a protected resource. So in this particular slide, you see there is a resource server. Uh, and an authorization server. Um, if you take a product like, um, for example, API Manager, these, both of these can come in, in the same package, um, or these could be completely two different products, right? So um, typically what happens is the client uh, requests uh, uh, an access token from the uh, authorization server, then the resource owner has to grant the permission for, that, uh, for the client to um, use that API, and then the, um, it is conveyed to the a client uh, as, a, as a token, uh, which can then be used to access the protected resource that is there on the resource server, right? So this is how this whole thing happens. So there are, so there's absolutely no um, authentication part in this. Uh, so what, what brings the authentication onto this? It is the open ID uh, that, is, uh, that, is that can happen on top of O2, right? So if it's, a, it's a common practice for you to use open ID together with O2 so that it takes care of the authentication part of it and then returns uh, an ID token together with the access token. So you have that information um, for, uh, you know, for use as well. So um, there are multiple ways for you to um, obtain these access tokens. Uh, and, and depending on how you do it, it's, uh, they are referred to as grant types uh, in the O2 spec. So some of the common grants grant types are authorization code, implicit, client credentials, resource owner password. Um, it doesn't have to be limited to this. Um, if you look at, uh, for example, um, API manager or uh, identity server product, you will see a few more grant types being uh, supported out of the box. Um, it also gives you the chance of writing your own custom grant type if you want to. Um, 
so I'm not going to go uh, very high detail or very deep into this, uh, any, any of these, because this you can easily find literature out there uh, on how each of these techniques work. But the important point to note here is that if you take something like authorization code, which is pretty much the safest one out of, the, out of all of them, um, there are certain scenarios that you would use some of these. So here, uh, the, 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 the high level uh, idea is that um, once the, uh, if the client is granted access to these APIs, it is um, the authorization server returns something called an authorization code. Right, so that code um, comes through. So obviously, usually it is um, it is a web application, uh, for example, I I that's that that might be requesting access to the APIs. So there is always a user agent like a browser involved here, right? So when the uh, authorization server returns the um, the access to uh, access uh, authorization code, um, the 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 user agent can actually see that because it comes as a redirection, right? Um, however, the, the, the nice thing about this technique is that after it obtains the authorization code, it can then exchange that code for an access token. And that happens directly between the client and the authorization server so that it's quite secure and um, you know, nobody can uh, sniff that or you know, have um, access to it. Uh, because if you do it through a browser, obviously, um, there could be other applications that are running on the browser uh, or even the resource owner can have access to that. So this is quite safe in that manner. Um, so although there are uh, other grant types like implicit, for example, this is the typical practice if, you, um, if you're writing, let's say, a, a JavaScript application that runs on, the, on a browser or a single page app, let's say if you're using a, technique like, um, a technology like ReactJS or something like that, um, you don't have a way of storing the client credentials on the or on the browser itself. So what you do is you use this implicit grant type um, where um, the authorization server directly gives you an access token without any authorization code being involved. Um, so in, this, in these scenarios, you have to treat that access token as a, something that's public knowledge. So what I mean by that is um, if you're using the, this technique, you have to make sure that um, what you can do with that access token is quite limited because there is a chance of this being you know, visible to outsiders or uh, being um, exposed to the public. Um, so um, if you, um, so okay, so let's go on to the next one as well. So there's a client credentials grant type where um, here the, the idea is that the client and the server are uh, trusted parties um, and they are only using, there's no user authentication uh, or the resource owner authentication here. Um, they are only using the client credentials as a result uh, because the idea here is that the, the assumption here rather is that the resource owner is the client uh, as well. So it's a very basic exchange of um, um, information and tokens here uh, and it's, uh, it's not as safe as uh, authorization code um, at all. Um, and a and couple of more things that I forgot to mention is in authorization code grant type, you obviously get a refresh token together with the access token. In implicit, you don't get a refresh token. In client credentials also, you don't get a refresh token. Um, and then the last one is um, resource owner password uh, grant type. Here, what happens is the client obtains the resource owner's credentials, uh, first of all, uh, without any redirections, and then just makes a single call with the resource owner's credentials as well as the client credentials to the authorization server, and then gets an access token back. So here you also get a refresh token uh, as part of it. So other than these four techniques, now um, I, I briefly mentioned about um, uh, single page apps. Um, so while uh, grant types such as implicit has been used over the years, uh, there's uh, more and more uh, best practices that um, security experts are now suggesting that you use different flavors of auth authorization code grant type, so not just just plain old authorization code, but you use it with something like Pixie, right? Um, which is which is another way of cha um, uh, including another challenge um, uh, together with the authorization code grant type, so that um, there's added security. So if you if you are writing a native mobile app or a single page app, now the the way to go is um, still use authorization code. Um, so there's plenty of material on these on the web. 
um, w one, one, uh, one place that I can recommend is uh, our identity server team has a series of blogs that they published about these topics. Um, Paul mentioned about Prabhat in the morning, who's the uh, who's our, our head of um, you know security architecture. He has a really cool blog about these these things as well. So you will find plenty of information in in those uh, about each of these. So um, I mentioned earlier that uh, or two only takes care of the authorization part, and then uh, the authentication has to happen through some other mechanism. Um, and I spoke a little bit about uh, Open ID. So that's another aspect that you have to think about when you're working with APIs. How do you onboard users, and then how do you authenticate users, right? So um, this seems like a very trivial, common question, right? So the, the, the traditional way of doing this is by having a, a web form, right? You go and sign up using either a self-sign up or a, uh, or a form that you can fill out and then submit, and then you get a confirmation email. You go and um, verify your email address, and then you, know, you have an account now. So just imagine how many of these accounts you have right now, or with how many systems you have, how many applications you have such accounts. So at the rate that we are using or trying out new applications, there are so many passwords that we'll have to use uh, and remember. Um, and also, this becomes a really cumbersome thing. Every time you want to use a service or an application, you have to go and sign up. So this is called registration fatigue. Um, and pe more and more people are feeling this, and they don't want to fill out forms like this. right? So. In, if you're an organization who's looking at something, um, something, um, what's the word, uh, innovative or uh, cool uh, in, in onboarding your users, what can you do? Can you replace this with something? So one such thing that you can do is you can do BYOID or bring your own ID, right? So this is something um, where, so I'm sure everybody here has a social, uh, you know, social media, some sort of an account, either Twitter, Facebook, uh, you name it, right? Or Google or whatever. Um, and and uh, you use it quite heavily, right? So what if you can use that, uh, that same login or that same account to log into multiple systems? So um, another thing, another option is um, governments around the world are also now trying to uh, move into a, a central identity system where all the government services are you know, enabled through single sign-on capabilities and so on. So they might have also introduced certain um, identity um, techniques or identity services. Uh, it could be one of them that you're, you're, you're using here. So um, what I'm trying to say is, as an organization, what you can do is you can open up uh, to some of these identity services and 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 give the um, give the um, the users the chance of using some of their existing IDs. So how do you do that? Now, if you take a product like WSO2 Identity Server, it um, it supports social logins. So you can easily integrate any of these social logins through uh, to the normal identi uh, identi or authentication process. So whenever you um, you uh, authenticate a user, what you do is you sort of federate that onto the the, the identity provider, external identity provider, uh, that is a social login, and then um, let them do the authentication. So one extra thing that you might get out of this is um, some of these social logins or social uh, media systems might also give you certain information about the users, obviously with their consent, right? Um, that might be quite useful if you're a business that thrives on um, information about users what their likes, dislikes are, hobbies, what, they, what do they buy, things like that. So that, that could be something that's interesting that you can get out of this as a byproduct. Right, so now we, let's assume that we've onboarded the users. The next step is how to authenticate them. Once again, the traditional way of doing it, if you're using a username password, is to have a web form like this. You enter that and uh, you enter your uh, email or username and password, and then you get authenticated. Now, if you remember a few years back, there was a few data breaches in the world. One of them is the 2017 Verizon data breach. Um, so here are some stats out of that that people found. Um, so over 70% of the employees 
they found out are reusing their passwords at work. Over 59% of them reuse the same password everywhere. Then 81% of the hacking related breaches uh, leveraged on either stolen or weak passwords. So this is a rate that has gone up over the years up until um, 2017 from 50 to 66 and to 81. So there is a growing trend out there that, so, uh, that shows passwords are not secure. Right? So that's something that you have to think about. That should, should not be your last line of defense, obviously. So what can you do? So this is, this is a, once again a failed thing, the, pa the password-based authentication. So something that you can think about is this concept called strong customer authentication. We also call the same thing, it's a different name, as multi-factor authentication. So because multi-factor authentication or strong customer authentication is about breaking that authentication um, into multiple steps and you use um, those steps to verify different things about the users or different factors in each step. And, and that gives you uh, multiple chances of making sure that it's the right person. So how do we do that? Um, the authentic authentication factors that you can use in, in, uh, in multi-factor authentication, the first one is knowledge or something, of something you know about. Uh, you know, something that you know, like a password or a passphrase or a PIN number. Um, then the second one is um, something that you possess, something that you have. Um, say your phone that can receive a one-time password on SMS or some other way. Uh, a token or a hardware token that gen can generate you a, a one-time password, a badge, a smart card or something like that. Something that you possess. And then something that you are. Something like your unique fingerprint, your facial features, the, the retina patterns or the color of your retina or your voice print. So there, these are some of the things, techniques that are used out there as authentication factors. So in multi-factor authentication, um, the idea is that you use at least two of them, two of these, and then authenticate that user in two steps. So uh, when I say at least two of them, you have to pick from these different categories. Um, so one from knowledge, one from position, or one from knowledge, one from inheritance. So you have to, you, you should not pick something like a password and a passphrase from the same category because that's once again something that you can easily misplace and somebody else can get access to. So the idea is that you go across these factors. So how do you do this? Now if you have a, um, a WSO2 identity server for example, it allows you to do this um, multi-factor or two-factor authentication by allowing you to define different steps in your authentication. Um, and then you can choose what you want to engage at each step. So one example here is at the first step, you can maybe uh, allow the user to sign up with an email or a user ID or log in with Facebook. As a second step, you can use a, a FIDO um, compatible device, maybe a mobile phone or something like that, to receive a one-time password or, or an authorization request that you have to approve on this or use something like a Google Authenticator. So there are multiple options like this that you can use. Uh, so Identity Server obviously gives you that um, uh, chance of combining some of these together and then doing it. It doesn't have to be limited to two. Uh, I actually, um, uh, Identity Server can do multi-factor as in you can decide how many factors you wanna use. Now, so fine, I mean, this looks quite cool. Uh, so if you, if you have multi-factor uh, implemented at your organization, is that it? Are you safe now? Well, apparently 90% of the Google users have not even configured their two-factor authentication. So it is there as a, as a feature in Google, but nobody's using it. Why? What's the reason? We are lazy. Right? We obviously want to, we, we obviously will pick convenience over security. Right? Sometimes it's, it's too much of a hassle for you, you know, for you to use these multiple factors. Right? Um, so for example, every time you log into a system, you have to wait until you get a, a password on your phone. Right? And you might be traveling at that time. You might not have really good internet or you know, a phone connection to receive something like that. So you, you, can, you can get into such scenarios, 
that makes it quite cumbersome. cumbersome. So let's say you, you are given a hardware token that generates a, a, a one-time password, right? You have to carry this with you all the time. If you forget it, you can't log in, right? So there are, it, it, it is not convenient, right? So as, as humans, we always go for convenience over anything else. So what's the solution for this then? So the solution to this really is that authentication needs to be a little bit more dynamic, responsive, and then context sensitive. So what we call this particular thing is adaptive authentication. Um, so adaptive authentication means that instead of just looking at the, the configuration steps of what first factor, second factor is, it also goes beyond that and looks at what context you're using this. One example, um, let's say Alex is a person who lives in Europe. Um, so he logs in from Europe to some account. Then he takes a flight to uh, North America. The second time he logs in to his account is from North America, right? Now, if you're using adaptive authentication, um, when you get the request, authentication request or login request, you will see that they are coming from two different geolocations, right? So what do you do then? Um, if you purely go by the location only, you will realize that it's a new location. So perhaps it's, uh, it's uh, somebody else using it uh, because Alex, 99% of the time uses it in Europe or in a specific country, uh, but now this is coming from North America, right? So if you're using, say, multi-factor authentication here, so one thing that you can do here is if you're not sure whether this is Alex or not, you, um, so the first time the Alex logged in could be just using username password. Second time, you enforce uh, the second factor as well, uh, just because you're not sure and there is a difference here. Another thing you can do maybe as part of uh, adaptive authentication here is also consider how after how many hours is the second login happening? Is it, so you, you know that there's two different locations, but the second location, the login from the second location happens after 20 hours. <coughs> and it's a very plausible scenario because somebody can travel within 20 hours. So if you combine these two things together and look at that context, this could be very well could be a legitimate login. And then you can, based on that, depending on the sensitivity of the information you're protecting, you can either decide to enforce the second factor or not. Now, what if these two logins happen just within minutes apart? Does it mean that it's always a fraud or somebody else uh, you know, logging into uh, Alex's account? It might not be. Alex might be using a VPN to connect to you know, some server in North America and then logging in, right? So you have to take it with that context in mind um, and then uh, the idea here is that this concept is called geo-velocity, where you, um, you consider a person's location as well as the time between the consecutive logins that happen from different locations and then make a decision based on that. So if you're using uh, adaptive authentication, this is something that you can do. Um, engage the second factors based on uh, such a decision. Another scenario, is let's say that there is a, um, um, an app like a healthcare app that holds some sensitive information about a, 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 a patient or a, a, or a user. The first time that um, the, the user logs into this system, they can just browse the information, um, but the user wants now to um, download uh, some medical reports, which is slightly higher authority that's required and, si and obviously a lot more sensitive information. So at that point, you can engage the second factor, right? Based on the exact operation that they, they do with it. Um, so this is another scenario that you can, um, you can use with adaptive authentication. All of you ha may have experienced this. If you're using a social login or Google or whatever, uh, the first time that you log in from a new device, it, uh, it uh, understands that you're, you're logging in from a new device and asks you to go through the entire authentication process because it hasn't seen this device before, right? So that's another thing that uses adaptive authentication. So based on that, you can either engage or not engage uh, additional factors. So if you have a product like WSO2 Identity Server, how do you, um, how do you implement something like this using it? <coughs> 
So there's two aspects that you have to think about. One is the adaptive part of it. Um, all of these scenarios have some sort of business rules around it. What you want to do based on some of these factors. And the second part of it is what do you want to engage as the second factor or even if there's a third factor? How do you do that? So the first portion of it is about defining your business rules around authentication. And uh, one of the uh, cool features that we've added to the identity server is the ability to script that logic using JavaScript. So um, in the adapti adaptive authentication module within the identity server, now you are able to write some sort of um, business logic or some authentication logic on how you want to authenticate using JavaScript. Now, if you are not familiar with JavaScript, still you can do it because there are so many templates out of the box that comes uh, with identity server for the common scenarios, such as you know geo-velocity and so on. It can also do something a little bit more advanced than um, the JavaScript part of it by integrating with something like WSO2 stream processor, which, is, which has the CEP or the complex event processing capabilities as well as the ability to use machine learning models. So you can do a lot more advanced type of um, adaptive authentication using those. So that's one aspect of it. So identity server comes with built-in features for this um, for you to use. Then the second part of it is how do you do this multi-factor authentication using it? So the simple answer is um, identity server has a lot of uh, identity connectors uh, that you can use um, that allows you to use a lot of these author uh, authentication services that are out there. Um, so just like the integrator, it has a, a, a lot of uh, connectors that you can download from the store and that's readily available for you to use. Um, and you will, if you log into that, you will see that most of the popular ones are covered there. Again, if the system that you want to connect to is not found there, pretty easy that you can also um, write a custom connector for it using the, uh, the extension framework that we have. So with these two features in um, the uh, in the identity server, you can easily uh, implement adaptive authentication. So let's look at some of these flavors that's available within the identity server. So I spoke about the static authentication flow where you decide uh, the, the first factor, the second factor, and those factors get, um, um, those get engaged for any login that you do. There's absolutely no uh, differentiation there, so the static authentication flow. Identity server also have built-in capabilities to do it on request-based conditional uh, authentication. So what that means is um, identity server can look at some attribute of the, the request, me request message and then engage adaptive authentication based on that. So one example I can give you is, let's say you're, you're, you have a banking application and you're doing a money transfer You've engaged the first factor. Now there is a second factor that you can engage. You don't want to engage the second factor for transactions that's less than, let's say, 100 US dollars. If it is a small amount, you don't engage it because it's inconvenience to the user. If it is more than $100, you engage it. So you make that decision based on the transaction amount, which, is, which can be a part of the message or the request that comes in. Then you can also um, use the, uh, the user-based conditional authentication flow feature in Identity Server. Uh, what this does is it looks at the role of the user uh, and then ties that um, to the authentication factor. So um, you, if, you're, if you're, say, a manager or an admin, you might be able to do certain elevated tasks within the application. Uh, and based on the roles that you have, it might engage the additional, um, additional factors to ensure that you are in fact the person who you claim to be before, you, before it lets you do that. So then the final one is risk-based uh, authentication uh, flow, uh, which sort of combines all of these that I mentioned about. Uh, this, is, this is the one that um, you use something like an inference engine or uh, a complex event processor, um, where you, um, you write some rules that calculate some sort of a risk score. So one... Um, Example for that is a fraud detection uh, system. Um, in, in, in open banking and, uh, and fraud detection systems, there's something called a, a, a fraud score, a fraud scoring mechanism that uh, 
um, depending on the type of transactions, the amounts, and the, the frequency, and f uh, a few other attributes, um, that they do some sort of scoring and um, identify whether these transactions can be fraudulent or not. So if the, 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 the fraud score, the risk score is high, then um, you engage the additional factors. So that's the whole idea of this. So um, basically, these are the new features that we've added to Identity Server that allows you to implement um, and then make the authentication experience of your users uh, a lot more uh, user-friendly and, um, uh, and uh, also interesting. Um, so the, the key takeaways that I want you to um, realize from this is that um, you know, the use of OAuth2 and OIDC in the API security space is, is, a, is a given thing. That's the industry standard. Uh, however, you have to think about other aspects like how you onboard users, how you authenticate users, and so on. Um, and then you have to, um, so in, if you, if you um, concentrate only about the authentication part of it, um, just simply using something like a password will not be enough. So you have to think about something like multi-factor authentication. Uh, and then um, you have to engage multi-factor authentication in such a way that it doesn't become a, uh, a hindrance or a hassle for the users. So the, the, the right thing to do there is use something like adaptive authentication that makes it a lot more easier for the users to use. So Ident WSO2 Identity Server obviously has support for all of these features um, that's uh, available out of the box. Um, adaptive authentication as well as um, multi-factor authentication using some of the connectors and inbuilt features. Thank you. <laughs>